All right, Deuteronomy chapter 11, and there's quite a bit here. So let me put this up here so that you, once you turn this thing on, it does wonders. There it is. All right. There are several main divisions here, and we will get through the first three, okay? So we're not going to cover the entire chapter today. So there's so much going on. Um, you'll notice that charge one, two, three, four, five, and then choice and command. Um, charge, that's, um, I could have used different words there. I could have used the word command and put in there, you know, you got, you got this command. Uh, what is charge? What is a charge? A charge would be like me giving you some responsibility, something like, you know, you, you, you're responsible for doing this. You know, if I said, okay, your, your job is to vacuum the room, you know, um, do that, you know, vacuum up all the spots and all the whatever, and that would be a charge to you, okay? Giving you some responsibility to do something. And uh, that's what these are. I could use the word command again, different things, but uh, I went with charge. Uh, verses 1 through 7, 8 through 12, you'll see all of that. Uh, what you will notice as we get into the second charge, the, the first charge doesn't necessarily have it. God's, or rather Moses, I'm sorry, is telling them to do something. Uh, but as we get into 2, 3, 4, and 5, which again, we will not cover all of those, you'll see that they become conditional, that these are charges or commands or, uh, you know, you need to do this. And, it's, and it's, uh, there are conditions attached to it. That, you know, if you do this, then this will happen. And uh, so it becomes very interesting for me and maybe even you. Verses 1 through 7 is where we see our first of these charges. And again, this doesn't come with any uh, conditions on it. Uh, but let's, let's look at verse 1 and start to read here. It says, Therefore you shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments all ways. Now, there are several things here that we need to make mention of, and that is the word therefore. The word therefore indicates for us that this is based on what he's saying right now in this verse is based on whatever he just got done saying. Now, if you were to go back to chapter 10, which we are not going to do, we've done that already. You go back to chapter 10, you find that he's speaking of uh, uh, many of the same things, but it's basically about being obedient to God. And then he says in verse 1, therefore, okay, so keeping in mind that God is good, you shall love the Lord your God. God has always, always, Old Testament, New Testament, from Genesis to Revelation, God has always operated in love. The Bible says that God is love, and he thus operates that way. And what he desires from you and I is that you and I would be motivated by love. In fact, that you and I would be motivated by his love that he has for us. Whenever you and I love God, that is in return or in response to God's love for us. God always loves us first. He always has loved us first. And so when he says here, therefore, you shall love the Lord your God, it's the idea is that God loves you, thus you shall love him back. Now, it's also important to note that because of that God desiring love and we, he wants us to be motivated by love, it's important to understand that, that this is the way it has always been with God. I say that because oftentimes people see God differently in the Old Testament and then different in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, he was grouchy, and he was mean, and he killed people, and he commanded things. But in the New, New Testament, there's Jesus, and he's kind of this, you know, uh, gentle, you know, tanned, uh, hippie guy walking around the countryside, and, you know, he's just so gentle and sweet. But God has not changed at all. God has always been the same, and God has always uh, operated in love and always been motivated and wanted us to be motivated by love. Now... This introduces for you and I, there is a biblical principle here that you and I want to pay attention to, found in verse 1. We've not even gotten to verse 2 yet. Verse 1, therefore you shall love the Lord your God. Okay, got that. I need to, I need to love God. I, that's what I need to do. You shall love the Lord your God and keep. Okay, so there are two main words, and there are lots of, um, or key words, I should say, lots of key words in these verses. But here's the first, the first two of many, and that is in verse one, the first key word is love, okay, love. Whatever we're doing to or with or for God must be motivated by love. 
secondly goes hand in hand is the word keep that introduces or, or, or implies for you and I the idea of keeping or doing when it says to keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, his commandments always. And, and by the way, the word charge and statutes and judgments and commandments, those are just all the different ways to hear from God. Those are all the different ways that God speaks. Uh, it might be a charge. He's given us some responsibility to do this thing. Statutes, that's something that's officially, you know, from him. It's written down and now it's law. Statute. His judgments, okay, those are the things that he's decided. And then his commandments, of course, we know what those are. There's ten commandments. There are other commandments. But those are all just different ways of hearing from God. And what he says here is, love the Lord your God. And the word if is not in there, but you'll understand it in just a minute. If you love the Lord your God, then you will keep his charges, his statutes, his judgments, his commandments always. Here's, here's the, 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 the principle that I want to make sure that we not miss to, uh, this afternoon. And it is this, that if you love, then you will do. If you will love, then you will do. If you love, then you will give. Jesus reiterated this for us when he said in John chapter 14, verse 15, he said, if you love me, keep my commandment, commandments, John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. In other words, Jesus was essentially saying there, if you love me, show me. Now, this is a biblical concept that if we love, then we will do or give. The world, the reason that I'm slowing down to talk about this is because it's specifically because I am talking to a room full of teenagers. And when there is a, a, when there are teenagers involved, relationships uh, are a high priority, perhaps the highest priority. Whether that be a friendship relationship or whether that be a boyfriend girlfriend relationship relationships are a high priority everybody wants a relationship some of you desire a relationship a really good relationship with a good friend some of you desire maybe all of you you desire a relationship with a boyfriend or a girlfriend some someone of the opposite gender nah, not, me. <laughs> not maybe not now maybe not now but at some point you will unless Unless you've been called to singleness like Paul, and you're just like, hey, I don't need nobody, man. I'm serving the Lord the rest of my life. Forget all that drama. But the majority of people in here are going to want some, you know, the, a relationship like that, friendship or more. And it is, it is, it would behoove you. That means it is extremely important for you to pay attention to this, and that is that people will come along, and they will say to you three magic words. What are those three magic words? I love you. Right? They'll say, I love you. And they will throw that out there because it's easy to throw out. It's easy to say to somebody, I love you. Right? However, what you need to do is you need to be able, through all of the excitement and the emotion of hearing those words, somebody other than my mom loves me. Because you know that your mom loves you. you know that your dad loves you. You know, your, your grandma tells you, I love you, mijo. You know, you already know that. It's like, oh, yeah, it's great. Thank you very much, grandma. I love you, too. But somebody new comes along. And he smells great. Or she's really, really cute. And that individual says to you, I love you. What will happen oftentimes is the emotions go wild, man. And you're just like, whoa, they said love. I'm, I'm, I'm all about it. Like, yes. Yes. What you need to be able to do is you need to be able to grab the reins. Okay, those of you that ride horses, grab the reins. You pull on those things. Pump those brakes, man. You slow it down. And what you want to be able to do is to evaluate and say, wait a minute. This individual said that they love me. I love you. I heard it. 
But then I'm going to take myself back to Deuteronomy chapter 11 and go, wait a minute. God set something up here. Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God, Moses said, and keep, shall do. If you love the Lord your God, then you will do something. Now, in this case, it's to be obedient to, the, to, to God's word. But the principle is there, that if someone loves you genuinely, okay, if they love you, then what they will seek to do is to impart into your life. They will seek to input into your life. They will seek to give to you. They will be looking for ways to serve you. Why is that such a big deal? Because the world has a different definition of love. If I in the world say I love you, what that does is that becomes a key. Put it in the lock, unlock someone's heart, and then I'm able to look around and take all that I want from that individual. And the majority of people in the world today that are not Christians, but even lots of Christians do this, they say they love one another. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And yet what they actually mean is I want to unlock so that I can take what I want. I want to unlock that treasure chest so I can, I want to get what I want. And the majority of people in relationships today are looking for what they can get out of the relationship. However, the Christian biblical worldview is looking at the relationship to see what I can put into it. And that is always going to be the case. And it's a good measure. It's a good, it's a good guide for you. It's a good ruler for you to look and go, wait a minute, this individual is telling me they love me but they keep borrowing money from me. Like, what, what's, what's, they keep taking. I notice they don't ever buy me lunch, man. They're always expecting me to buy lunch. Or, you know, they're, they're coming and they're trying to take something more, more valuable. You see what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? They're trying to get something from me. So, so I, I don't, you, and then you're able to, to evaluate and go, you know what? I don't think they said love, but I don't think they understand what love is. And it's even good to ask them, like, what, is, what, what, what exactly is love? What do you think love is? Or what does love do? And here we're being taught, and we've heard it before. The reason I'm pointing it out or making a big deal about it today is because some of you are, again, you're brand new to the Deuteronomy study, and maybe you've not uh, uh, realized this before. But what, what Moses is reminding them here is that, listen, if you love God, then you will do what he says. That's the principle. Love. Not love and take, love and do, love and give. Again, Jesus said that, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, he goes on to clarify who exactly he is talking about here, and I'll put this up. Um, uh, he's addressing these eyewitnesses. I will read this for you because, again, I want to be mindful of those that haven't been around for the Deuteronomy study. And you get a little bit of history here as we read through this. Some of you, you already know this. You're experts already. Bear with us, please. Know today that I do not speak with your children. He says, I'm not, I'm not directing this at your kids who have not known and who have not seen the chastening of the Lord. The idea is you haven't seen it like you have. You've not seen the chastening of the Lord your God, his greatness and his mighty hand and his outstretched arm, his signs and his acts, which he did in the midst of Egypt to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to all his land. What he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses, and their chariots, how he made the waters of the Red Sea overflow them as they pursued you, and how the Lord has destroyed them to this day. What he did for you in the wilderness until you came to this place, and what he did to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, incredible story, the son of Reuben, how the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed them up, their households, their tents, and all the substance that was in their possession in the midst of all Israel. But, he says in verse 7, your eyes have seen. In other words, eyewitnesses. Your eyes have seen all of these things. Eventually, I mean, essentially is what he's saying there. Your eyes, in verse 7, have seen every great act of the Lord, which he did. So, your kids don't know this yet. They're learning it. He's, but he says, I'm talking to those of you that have seen God work. You know God's goodness. I want you to think about that. So love the Lord your God. If you love him, then you'll do, and you'll do because you've seen all of his goodness to you. 
And that is such a good practice for you and I to look back and go, you know what, how good has God been to me? And you go back and you begin to count your many blessings, number them one by one, right? Count your many blessings, see what God has done. You go back and you start looking, oh, you know what, God did this and God did this and God did this and God did this. And that's, it's, it's an extremely valuable practice, especially um, when you find yourself sitting in some doctor's office on, on the table and things are so uncertain and I'm not really sure what's going on with my body and what's happening and, and uh, the, I, the doctors are doing tests and trying to figure that out. And, and that can do a number on your mind, right? It starts messing with your mind. And so you're, you want to be able to stop yourself and look back and go, wait a minute. I don't know, I don't know what's about to happen. I don't know what the doctor is going to come back in here and tell me. It may be horrible news. But God, as I look back, I think, and I, and I count the, my blessings, I go, you know what? God has been uh, 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 faithful here, and he did this, and he did that, and he did this, and he answered my prayer. And you go back through, and you're listing those things off. What that does is those things encourage you in the now. So that's a good practice. And Moses is telling them, listen, what I'm telling you, uh, I'm telling you with some basis. Look back and see how God has been or how good he's been. And now I want you to be obedient to him. Love him and be obedient to him. Your eyes have seen it. You've been an eyewitness. That takes care of our first charge. Let's move on to our second charge in verses 8 through 12, where it says, therefore. Okay, so again, therefore means now, now that we know what we, just, what we just heard, what we just read, with that in mind, you shall keep every commandment which I command you today. He repeats what he did at the very beginning in verse 1. You got you to gotta keep. You got to be obedient. Do these things. Okay? Because God has been good, do this. And he tells them in verse 8, because I stopped halfway through, we, we, we get the first of our conditions. Conditional. Now, let me point this out for you. Verse 8, therefore, okay, because of what we just heard, what we know about God, do this. What should I do? Keep every commandment, okay? And then there's a key word. There's another key word. So our first key word in verse 8 is keep, <clears throat> keep, sorry. And that, that, that indicates for us you gotta, you got to do something. Keep, keep the commandment, do the commandment. That's what that means. But then in the middle of verse 8, he uses the word, four-letter word, that, T-H-A-T, that. What that does is it indicates for you and I that there is a condition here. That if you do what? If you keep the commandment, if you keep every commandment, there is a result for doing that. In verse 8, that you may, and there's three things in verses 8 and 9 that he mentions. The first thing is that you may be strong. I called that power. Why did I call it power? Because it starts with a P. And I get weird about that stuff. I'll, you'll, it'll become clear uh, why in just a moment. But power. He says that you may be strong. If you will keep every commandment, you'll be obedient to God's word, then you will be strong. Secondly, and go in and possess. Possession. I do not mean like demonic possession, okay? I'm talking about going in and possessing the land. We'll talk about the land in just a minute. We'll take a little break here in just a second. And I'll explain some things. But power, first of all, if you're obedient to God's word, then you will experience power, and then you will also experience possession. You'll be able to take possession of things. In their case, the land. But we'll, I'll, I'll explain this for you in just a second. He says in verse 8, And go in and possess the land which you cross over to possess. Cross over to possess? I'll explain it. Verse 9, here's the third one. And that you may prolong, prolong your days in the land. That you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swore to give to your fathers, to them and their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, what he's telling them here is, is that you're getting ready to go over into this land. It's a land that's flowing with milk and honey. I'll explain that in just a second also. You're not in there yet, but you're on your way there. Now, let's stop for a second so that I can explain some things to you, especially to those of you that haven't been here. Um, and then for all of those that have been here, but you were uh, watching YouTube videos last night really late, and now you're falling asleep and you're going, what is Deuteronomy and what is the Bible and what is a commandment? Um, so let me explain something to you, okay? So 
um, you got you got the land of you got the land of Israel. Okay, picture this land. Here's the land. Over on the west side, my left, your, our left side would be the ocean. Okay, then you got land, of course, of course, the shore and the land. Okay, and then there's a river. Okay, so you got ocean, you got land, you got the Jordan River. And then on the other sort of the side of the Jordan River would be the east side of the Jordan River. Okay? The children of Israel are on the east side. So east side, Jordan River, west side, ocean. They need to go from the east side. They need to cross over. That's why he said here in verse 8, cross over. The land which you're, you're going to cross over. You need to cross over the Jordan River into the land. Everybody following? Any questions? No? Good. All right. So they're supposed to cross the Jordan and go into the new land. Okay? They're going to need some things when they get in there. They're going to need power. They're going to need to be strong. They're going to need to possess the land. And they're going to want to stay there as long as they possibly can. can the, the, the prolonging of their time there. Okay? But they've got to get from the east side, cross over the Jordan, over to the west side. Okay? And so, in order to accomplish all of that, they're going to need some power to even get over across the, across the, 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 the um, Jordan River and get into the land. Once they get in there, they'll need to be able to possess the land, take it. And then they'll, they'll be the prolonging. Once they're there, they're settled. Man, I want to stay here as long as I can. Okay? The key, the key to accomplishing all of that is obedience to God's word. That's what he told them in verse 8. Therefore, you shall keep every commandment which I command you today, that you may be strong. So if you, if you keep every command, if you're obedient to God's word, then you will have all that you need in order to do all of this, to accomplish all of this. Now, what this does is it gives us an opportunity again for me to explain some basics to you, okay? The story we began back in Genesis with a young man named Joseph. Anybody ever heard of Joseph? Joseph, okay. Joseph, by the time we get to the end of Genesis, there's incredible stories. It's the beginning of the world, basically. Not basically, it is in Genesis. By the time you get to the end of Genesis, what we, we, we zero in on is this young man named Joseph. Evidently, he was a good-looking guy. And he's in Egypt because he ended up there. He was uh, sold by his brothers. And now he's in Egypt and he becomes a slave. From, from becoming a slave uh, to being the ruler of Egypt, only second to Pharaoh. It's this incredible story, okay? And what happens is when he becomes ruler of Egypt, he actually brings all of his family. Well, they, this is a really cool story, but all of his family ends up there. And it sounds like, oh, man, this is great. They're living in Egypt. They got everything they need. But what happens is you get into Exodus. Okay, so we go Genesis to Exodus. Now, Exodus is the story of exiting. Exiting what? Exiting Egypt. Now, it's 300 years later after Joseph. His family has grown and grown and grown and grown and grown. And now his family has actually become slaves in Egypt because there's a new pharaoh. The new pharaoh doesn't, it's like, Joseph, who is this cat? I don't know him. And ends up enslaving all of his family. It's like they're, they're these 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 uh, uh, Israel, these Jews. They're multiplying too fast, and it's time to we got to do something about this, right? It's like when you have an infestation of of uh, rabbits. You know how fast rabbits multiply, man, and they're just like getting in your yard and eating all your stuff up. And you know, it's like we got to do something about this, and you start fencing things off or whatever, trying to keep them out. That was Pharaoh. You know, these guys are multiplying too fast. We got to get rid of them. So he enslaved them. And so the book of Exodus is the story of God using this man named Moses to rescue his people from being slaves in Egypt. And he rescues them from, from, from being slaves. Okay, Now that, now let's again pause for just a second because I need you to understand this. Where are we at so far? Like, we're Christians. We're not Israelites. It's 2023. We weren't there. So what does this really have to do with me? 
Well, this is what it is. It becomes a picture or an illustration for and of you and I. And here's, here's what this means. The picture of the children of Israel being rescued from slavery in Egypt is a picture of you and I, as Christians, being saved from slavery now, enslaved to sin, enslaved to Satan, and God saving us from that. Now, Exodus, they take off and they're on this journey, right? They're leaving Egypt, they're on a journey. You get into Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. In, in Exodus, the story is God taking his people out of Egypt. In Leviticus, the story is God taking Egypt out of his people. Let me say it one more time. Exodus is the story of God removing his people from Egypt. Removing his people from Egypt. Leviticus begins the story of God removing Egypt from his people. They had been there for so long, they were slaves, that they, Egypt was ingrained in them. They were at the bottom of Mount Sinai. They're waiting on Moses. Moses is up there getting these two tablets called the Ten Commandments. The people were all down below, and they got frustrated. They said, Moses has been gone way too long. We need to do something. We need to get out of here. We need to get, make us a God to lead us back to Egypt. See, Egypt was so ingrained in them that their first thought was, we need a God to lead us back because that's what they did in Egypt. They had gods for everything. Okay? So for you and I, the story is Exodus, God. It's a picture of God saving me from sin. Leviticus is the picture of, or the story of, God removing that sin from my life. He's given me a new way of life. And Leviticus and Numbers and even Deuteronomy, what's happening is that God is training his people the story. Just like your dad would teach you how to tie your shoes or teach you how to put your slip-on bands on. <laughs> Just like your dad would take you by the hand and teach you how to walk one step at a time, one foot in front of the other. Just like your dad would teach you how to Brush your teeth. How much toothpaste to put on there? Brush it like this. Small circles. Be gentle. Just like your dad would teach you how to go to the bathroom. How to clean up after yourself. How to cut your steak. How to use a fork. How to throw a ball. How to catch a frisbee. How to drive when to put your signal on, where the gas goes, where the oil goes. Just like a dad would teach you all those things, that's what God's doing in Leviticus and Numbers and even on into Deuteronomy, okay? And so the picture for you and I is this, that God saved us, just like Exodus, and then he begins to teach us a new way to live, the mind of Christ, looking at things differently, doing things differently. That's Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We're being reminded of all of those things. Okay, But what about the going into the new land? What about that? Because, see, after the book of Deuteronomy comes the book of Judges when they actually go into the land. What about that? What is, what is that? Isn't that? Isn't that like a picture of us going into heaven? No, it's not. What that is, it is a picture of you and I learning how to completely trust God. What? Yeah. Going to the promised land required faith. Now, they're, they're already rescued from sin, so they belong to God. That's us. But now, as they go into the promised land, the idea for you and I is that you and I would enter into the promised land or into that new land or into that rest, it's called. If you go over to the book of Hebrews, it explains these things for us. I'm just 
you know, making a long story even longer. What, 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 what we find out is that when we, you get into the promised land, the picture is that, hey, they, they're entering God's rest. They go there, they don't have to do anything to, to really, I mean, they're, sure, there's some things that they have to do. But the land is all set up. And so the idea is that you and I, what we're learning here is that you and I would trust God implicitly, that we would trust God with our very lives. And in doing that, if we trust God with our lives, then guess what? We experience the peace or the rest of God. That's the picture here. And for you and I, now let's bring it back to charge number two in Deuteronomy 11, verses 8 through 12. If this is a picture of my Christian life and, you know, what's happening and what God's doing, and then, then where does all this power and this possession and this prolonging come in? What does all this have to do with me? I'm glad that you asked. The power we need. In order to go from this side of the Jordan to this side of the Jordan, wait, you want me to cross a river? What? That's going to take faith. You want me to step, you want me to step over into what God has for me? It's going to take faith. That means not only am I going to have to cross the Jordan into this new land that I have never been to, but in the process, you're telling me I gotta leave that old life behind, that all of that over there? Yeah, it takes faith for me to leave all of my old life behind and follow God into the rest, into the peace, into all that he has for me. It, 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 it requires faith. I have to do, I have to, I have to not only step forward, but I have to let go of whatever's behind me. And so I have something in front of me pulling on me, tugging on me, but I also have something behind me pushing me and saying, hey, you know, this, this all the, or, or tugging on me, you know, pull, pulling at me back that way. Because, because over here, I already know all of this. This is comfortable to me. And so it's just, you know what, maybe I'll just stay over here. And the majority of Christians are just, they're just fine over here, wandering around in the wilderness, living in tents, so to speak, spiritually speaking, and uh, never really experiencing peace or rest. Always anxious. Always anxious. Why did why did Paul write to the Philippians? Be anxious for nothing. Nothing. Philippians chapter four, verse six, five and six. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Why did Paul write that to the Philippians? I thought the Philippians were Christians. Christians don't ever get anxious. Please. Some of you sitting here right now are anxious, filled with anxiousness. Some of you last night didn't sleep so well because you got, you got things going on in your life that are just eating up your mind, man, and you're not able to sleep. You got no peace because you're not sure what to do. You're not sure why it's happening. You're not sure how am I going to handle this. Some of you are anxious right now. You come in here, you have a hard time trying to concentrate on God's word and like, man, I got this thing and on the outside, I'm cool as a cucumber, but on the inside, my stomach is in knots, man. And I, I don't know, I don't feel like eating and I just, I, I'm not really sure what I'm gonna do about this. Some of you know that you're going to school this week. You got tomorrow off, amen? But Tuesday, you gotta be back at school. And you got to see that person or that teacher, or you got to turn in that report, or you got that test coming up, or whatever, whatever it is. And you got no rest, and you got no peace, and your insides are just like just tied in knots, and you're not like, well, what's going on? And and yet you're a Christian. You're supposed to be trusting God. But the reason that you don't have peace is because you haven't trusted God. That's why he wrote to the Philippians, "Be anxious for nothing." And see what happens is we you you, you come to Pastor Christian, you go, hey, you know what? I'm anxious. What should I do? My anxiety levels are through the roof. What should I do? I'm glad that you asked. Let's open up to Philippians chapter 4. And you go, great, man. Give me something. Come on. Give it to me. And then I go, look what it says here. Be anxious for nothing. But this, you get frustrated when I say that. Because you're so anxious that you can't wait and hear the rest of the verse. All you hear is be anxious for nothing. You think, oh, Paul doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> right? He doesn't know nothing about being anxious. No, he was speaking from experience to the Philippian to the Christians. Be anxious for nothing. We go, what, but how am I supposed to do that? I'm glad that you asked because he gives the instructions. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, in everything, by 
my prayer, my supplication. That means in my prayer, I'm giving it to the Lord. Make your requests known to God. And if I do, oh, by the way, I've got to add in thanksgiving. Okay, I'm not talking about the holiday. I'm talking about being thankful. I make my, my anxieties, my anxiousness known to the Lord. And then I thank him. For what? For my anxiousness? Well, I guess you could because it's driving you back to God. But the idea with be, be thankful or, or with thanksgiving is to, by, you're, you're living by faith. Lord, I'm giving you my anxiousness. I thank you in advance for what you're going to do because I know you're going to take it away. See how that works? So if I'm anxious, I'm going to make my request known. Whatever I'm anxious about, make it known to God. I'm going to do it with thanksgiving. Lord, thank you because I know you're going to work. By faith, I know you're going to work. And if I do that, then it says the result is, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. I don't understand it. I don't know. How do I just have peace about this situation? This is crazy. I can remember years ago when I first came to teach at Revival before I was ever on staff here. And uh, it was, I had taught in lots of places prior to, but, but coming here was going to be the, the biggest venue that I had taught in. And I kept expecting and waiting to be anxious. And as the week drew closer, I kept expecting to be anxious, but I wasn't anxious yet. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get anxious. I know I'm going to get anxious. And as the days got closer and closer to that Sunday, I kept expecting to be anxious. I'm going to be anxious. Anytime now, anytime now, it's going to, it's going to kick in. And then I got here and came into the sanctuary, looked around. It was like a, a sea of people. And first service, man, you ever been in first service? There are so many old people in there, <laughs> Right? And you look around and you go, man, look at all this gray hair. And look, I got my gray hair, okay? But you look at all this gray hair and it's like these people are older and smarter than I am. And no doubt some of them have been Christians longer than I have and probably can teach the Bible 10 times better than me. And so I come in I, and I'm waiting, to be, I'm waiting to get anxious. I'm waiting to get nervous. I'm waiting to get scared. And it's like, oh, okay, whatever. All right, let's go. And then I went backstage and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to get any time now. I'm going to get anxious, Lord. And I got to this weird place where I'm kind of like, okay, Lord, anytime now, you can let me be anxious. And, and, and then I get up on stage and I get out there and it's like, oh, there was never any anxiousness. I did not understand. Why not? Why wasn't I anxious? That's what he meant when Paul said, peace that surpasses all understanding. That's what he meant. He meant that if you will take your anxiousness, whatever it is that you're anxious about, and that if you will, in prayer, with supplication, that's giving it, supplying it to God, make your request known to God with thanksgiving, that if I do that, that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard my heart and my mind. See, Paul knew what he was talking about. Not just my heart, but I need my mind to be at ease also, right? Because I can fall asleep, you know, my heart's whatever, you know, thinking of whatever, whatever, but my mind, man, my mind, right? Your mind can just keep you up all night long, like Lionel Richie, right? Keep you up all night long, and you're just going crazy. But he says, no, if you do this, then you'll have peace in your heart and your mind. It'll guard your heart and mind, and you'll be able to rest. Now, all of that craziness that I just explained to you, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 11, that's the idea, is that the people are getting ready to go into the promised land, but they got to trust God, man. But if they trust God, if they trust God, if they cross over that Jordan, they're going to get power. They're going to be able to possess the land, and they're going to be able to stay in that land for a really long time. That's what I want. I cannot lose my salvation as a Christian. But I can't lose my peace. And the only way to lose my peace is to give it away. I give it away. I choose fear over faith. I can't lose my salvation, but I can lose my peace, man. But as I learn to trust God more and more, what happens is I experience more and more of the peace of God. That's what we're talking about. That's the picture here. That's why these things are so important. Because there are principles here that help you and I today in 2023. 
And this is one of them, charge number two in verse eight. Therefore, you shall keep every commandment which I command you today. And if you do that, that you'll be strong. You'll go in and possess the land which you cross over to possess and that you may prolong your days in the land. I want that. I want to, I want to experience all of God's peace for the rest of my life. But I can't do that if I'm disobedient. And he says at the end of verse eight, I love this. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. Meaning that it's got everything you need. I like milk and I like honey. I don't drink milk as much anymore because the cholesterol goes up. But honey, watch out. Mm -hmm. The Sabos hooked me up, man. I got so much honey from them. And it's delicious every morning. Boom, in my oatmeal. I put a little too much in there. <laughs> Oatmeal's good for me, but I'll probably end up getting diabetes <laughs> from all the sugar. <laughs> but it's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's got everything that you need. Everything's there. If you and I will trust God, we will find that all of our all of our resources are met. God's got it. I don't have to worry about anything. I don't, that doesn't mean I can be lazy, but if I'm trusting God, He'll man, He'll take care of it. So don't don't just don't don't worry about it. Don't freak out. God's going to take care of it. And I've been watching Him do that for thirty years. I've been and so he goes on to say, he describes the land for them in verses 10, 11, and 12. For the land which you go to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot. It was a vegetable garden. What he means by it, he, he either means that they had to walk their water to each spot and, you know, you, you, you water each plant or whatever. Or he could be referring to water pumps. They actually had water pumps in ancient Egypt that they would operate with a foot. They would pump that thing and it would pump water from the Nile over to their crops. Pretty incredible. But either way, what he's saying is you had to work for it. You had to work for it. Okay, have you ever had a garden? Anybody got a garden? Anybody got? Yes, there you are, right? All the godly people right there. If you've got a garden, you know, it's, it's hard work. It's hard work, okay? He says, it's not like that. Verse 11, but the land which you cross over to possess the land that you're going over into is a land of hills and valleys. That's a good thing. It's got hills. It's got valleys, which drinks water from the rain of heaven. That means bodies of water, lakes and rivers, and you got all the water that you'll ever need. And then he says in verse 12, interesting, a land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it, from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. Now, be on your guard because I'm about to ask you something, okay? So, you know, gird yourself like a man and prepare to give an answer. Let me read this for you one more time, verse 12. It says this about the land. A land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it. From the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. So God's eyes are always on this land. Okay, now listen. I gave you an illustration earlier. It was an air illustration, okay? I turned my back and I said, you know, we got this over here. We got this in the middle. We got this over here, okay? Now, over here, does anybody remember what was on the west side? Ocean. ocean. Next to the ocean was? River. Land. Next to the land was? River. The River Jordan. And then over here was? Which people? The Israelites. Okay? So we got Israelites over here. We need to get them from over here. We need to cross the Jordan, and we need to get them over here in this land. Who's in that land? Thank you very much. Who said that? Girl, go on. Go on. The first service didn't know. They're like, no, nah, I've just been sitting in here for two years going through the Old Testament. And I didn't know it was the Canaanites. What are you talking about? Okay? It's the land of Canaan. It's the Canaanites. So we need to get the Israelites from here. They're not in the land yet. They're over here. They're going to cross the Jordan, get into the land of Canaan. So the Israelites are not in the land of Canaan yet. Am I right? You're like, I'm not really, yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. The Israelites are over here. They're not in the land of Canaan yet. The Canaanites are in the land. Which makes it all the more trippy when you read verse 12. Because it says, he's talking about that land where the Israelites are not there yet. He says, it's a land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it. 
from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. Why would God be taking care of that land if it belongs to the sinful Israelites, or Canaanites? Canaanites are in there. They kill their babies. Why would God be taking care of their land and then have his people out here living like hobos in tents? Why would he be taking care of the land? What do you think? Preach, girl. Okay? Say it louder for the ladies in the back. Okay? A land for which the Lord your God cares. Why would he be taking care of it? Because of what Cassie said. Because he was preparing it for his people that he knew were going to show up. Now, why is that so interesting? Let me tell you why that's interesting. Because the Canaanites over here, they got a great land. Hills, valleys, lakes, rivers, uh, uh, animals, grain. They got everything that they need. And all this time that the Canaanites have been in the land, they assumed that the reason that their land was so great was because they had been sacrificing their babies, because they had been worshiping to their idols, to their gods. They thought that it was so great because of all of the, the sinful sexual practices that they had involved in all of their worship. And in their minds, their land was great because they were so great. Their land was great because they had all of these gods and all of these idols. Yet all along, God was blessing the land and in the process, blessing the Canaanites. Some of us don't like that, but that's, that's how it goes. They were healthy. They had multiplied in the land, the Canaanites, even though they were wicked. But it was all in preparation to get the Israelites in there push the Canaanites out and so that the Israelites would have a place prepared for them. Why is that so interesting? Here's why it's interesting because you and I never know what God is doing on the in the in the, you know, uh, uh, in the background. And you see someone and you go, "Man, how does that person like why are they rich, man? They're so sinful and you know, they're they're always doing wicked things and they hate God and yet they got all this stuff, man. They've they're just building this empire and you know, just living their best life." But you and I don't understand. You see, that individual, that celebrity that you might see, whoever it might be, they're building up their kingdom and they got all the money and the, 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 the you know, just all the treasures and the, and the whatever. They've got it all, the fame, the fortune, they got it all. But one of these days, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is their lungs will exhale, never to inhale again and their heart will stop beating, and their brain will die, and they will become food for worms. And all of the things that they had spent their life building up and amassing, all of their wealth, all of their fame, all of their fortune, will go to their bratty little kids. Lawyers will fight over it. They won't get to take any of it with them. And the entire life, their entire life, they will be thinking, hey, I'm building, look at my kingdom, man. Look at who I am. Look at how great I am. Look at all this stuff I'm gathering. Never understanding that God, in a sense, was blessing them with all of that stuff. They never acknowledged God. And once they died, they lost every single bit of it, right? And somebody else got it. And so we need to be careful, you and I, that we're not, man, like, all angry at God. Like, how come, you know, this person gets blessed? You know, why, why did they make the varsity team and I didn't? Why did they get picked and I didn't? You have no idea what God is doing. You have no idea what God is preparing. So just let God worry about that. You don't have to worry about that. All you got to do is, you just got to focus on living by faith. Now, let me just trust God and see what happens when, when you and I trust God and then I see these people prospering even though they're wicked. I can rest. No, so what? So what if he's in high school but he's pulling up in, you know, in a, in, in a brand new Benz or whatever? Like, so what? So what if I'm, you know, pushing my, my skateboard to school? So what? Let God do whatever God wants to do with him. I'm not concerned with that. I just want God to do whatever he wants to do with me. You never know what God might be blessing in preparation for someone else. 
and let's be careful. Now let's finish with charge three, and we'll move through quickly so that we can end it here. In fact, what I'm going to do as we look at verse 13 is I'm going to pull up the live uh, service here. They're not quite done yet, so relax, okay? They are almost done, so let's get you out of here. Charge number three. Let's move through it quickly. That will take us from verses 13 to 17, and then we'll be done. And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, it's just another way of saying be obedient to God's word, which I command you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Okay, so be obedient to God. Verses 14 and 15, you will be blessed. He's talking about when they're in the land. You'll be blessed with water. It says in verse 14, then, okay, so if you do this, then he will give you. Some of your translations might say, then I will give you. It actually should be translated, then he will give you. Because Moses is talking, and Moses ain't going to give him nothing. Moses is about to die. So who's going to give him water? God is. Then he will give you the rain for your land in its season the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain, your new wine and your oil. And I will send grass in your fields for your livestock that you may eat and be filled. Doesn't seem like that big of a deal to you and I because, you know, water, whatever. We've got plenty of water, right? That's what you think. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, we, we do have to be uh, uh, wise about our water here, but you guys don't understand that yet, Right? Because you're like, water shortage? <laughs> My pool looks fine. There ain't no water shortage, right? I don't have a pool. I am so sorry, man. <laughs> neither do I. Okay, neither do I. Okay? Both of my neighbors on both sides have pools, man. Oh. Yeah. And, and, and I, live, I live like, I don't, I don't live like in the ghetto, but I mean, it is San Bernardino. So it's pretty much ghetto. Okay? And, and, and both of my neighbors, man, I, summertime. I can hear them back there having so much fun. <laughs> Why are you <sighs> My Lord, why did they get blessed? And I don't get blessed. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but no, they have. Anyways, but usually you're like, there's no, there's no water shortage, right? You go in the shower, turn the knobs, there's, right? You're like, there ain't no water shortage. I took, a, I took a 45 minute shower. There ain't no water shortage, right? You don't really understand, okay? But it's water's water is precious, and for them, obviously, being in that type of place where they can't just turn on sprinklers or whatever, listen, they, they were depending. And what God is saying is, if you if you're obedient to me, I'm going to hook you up with rain. I'm going to give you rain, and that rain will do what? It will you know you'll it'll cause your grain to grow. Your new you'll get wine from the grapes. You'll get oil from the olive trees because of the water. Verse 15, check this one out. And I will send grass from the water, causes the grass to grow, right? I will send grass in your fields for your livestock that you may eat and be filled. Okay? Unless you're a vegetable Aryan, sorry. But God is saying, look, man, you're going to have grass. I'm going to hook you up with rain. You're going to get grass. The cows are going to eat. They're going to get big. Or goats, you know, maybe like birria, you know, whatever. Your animals, will, they'll grow, and then you're going to eat well. You're going to be filled, okay? You're going to be filled. All that from being obedient to God, if you're obedient. However, he finishes with a warning, and that's what we'll finish with. Kind of a sorry note to end on, but it is something to, to keep in mind. Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you, and he shut up the heavens so that there be no rain, and the land yield no produce, and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. Pastor David Guzik said this about this passage, The constant need for rain kept Israel in constant dependence on the Lord. It is good for us to have things that keep us in constant dependence on the Lord. We should never despise those things and long for the day when we will no longer need to depend on God as much. In the book of Haggai, we won't turn there, but just relay it for you real quickly. In the book of Haggai, the, there's, it's only two chapters. It takes you about 10 minutes to read. I suggest you read it. You could, I mean, instead of going through TikTok while you're on the toilet, you could read the book of Haggai. Okay? Let's just be honest, right? Read through the book of Haggai. And what you'll find is the first chapter of Haggai is all about God literally saying to them, you produced crops and then I blew it away. And you go, why would God do that? 
And he says in there, I did it because you weren't paying attention to me. So God, at times, will you know, blow those things away. And that's what he's, he's warning him here. He goes, if you listen, you pay attention, because if, you, if you're disobedient, then God's going to take away your water supply. Why would God do that? He hates us. No, because he wants to get your attention. And sometimes God will do that. He will take things away from you and I in order to get our attention. So let's be aware of that. Let's be aware of that. If I'm living in disobedience, God begins to remove things, man. To say, hey, hey, you're losing sight. Hey, you're getting distracted. Hey, over here, pay attention. Watch where you're going. You're going, you're going in the wrong direction. I'm trying to tell you. Wonderful concept to remember as you and I leave here. Uh, let's, let's keep our eyes on the Lord. Father, thank you so much for today. And uh, we thank you.